Hello everyone, my name is Peter Luongo and I'm delighted to welcome you here today to uh, the Symposium on Ukulele Instruction. I want to begin by thanking the team at Believe in Music, the NAM 2021 virtual event, Mary Lerzen, uh, Bethany Gilbert, Jessica Cortez, and of course our co-host, Senior Project Manager Eric Ebel. This is my third year working with this group of amazing individuals, and uh, I'm, del I'm delighted that we've been given access to this platform. It's a privilege and an honor. At this time, I'm going to ask the panel to join me. And as they do, I'm just going to let you know that in, in my 40 years in teaching ukulele as a school music teacher at the university level and in working with community and especially most recently with adult learners, uh, I've come to appreciate the capacity of the amazing instrument that we teach, the ukulele. It's an instrument that has allowed us to teach children in schools, to teach adults in communities, and to include them in instruction that's given them joy and a music education at the same time. My connection to the folks that are on this panel stretches from my time in Hawaii with some amazing performers and teachers, right through uh, my beginnings with Chalmers Doan, who initiated a program in Canada that has allowed us to teach ukulele through our school system. I've been blessed to be able to teach a number of students. One of those terrific students is James Hill, who's on and who, in fact, um, has a history not only as a, a performer, but as an amazing teacher and developer of resources. The other panelists here I've had the privilege of meeting through my time in the industry. And I'm delighted, delighted to be able to include them in the symposium. If today works, if today meets the objective, then what will happen is this group of international instructors, organizers, will be able to share with you some of their experiences, things that have worked in their experience as teachers, as instructors, and as organizers of events that have led to instruction and effective instruction. Today's format will be quite simple. We're going to allow each person to speak to what they know has worked in their experience and then allow you an opportunity to respond to that. You do have a chance to respond with questions or comments and we hope to include some of those as we go forward. There'll be a dialogue between members after each person's had an opportunity to share with you. And so without further ado, I'm gonna kick off today's discussion by asking each of our panelists to share with us their experience in ukulele instruction <coughs> and what's worked. And I'm going to begin with our friend, our first of two friends from Hawaii, Brian Tolentino. Hey, aloha mai kako. My name is Brian Tolentino. Um, I've been playing ukulele practically all my life since I was maybe eight years old. You know, the, the ukulele for us in Hawaii, is, it's always been part of our culture. Um, you know, you go to a wedding, you go to a baby party, you go to a funeral, there's always some sort of Hawaiian music and someone um, playing ukulele. Uh, rich history and unique history of the ukulele being, um, I guess, born in Hawaii in 1879. So we've, we've had that distinction as far as it's always been part of our culture. Um, the way I learned growing up was, um, you know, my mom maybe was my first teacher. There was no YouTube. There was no, you know, uh, recordings. You know, I, listen, I had to listen to eight tracks and albums and LPs, but that's how we learned. You know, we kind of, you see it, you hear it, and then you have to catalog it. You know, so we never learned the traditional, I guess, Western way of learning how to read notes, what chord is this. We just learned um, what sounded good to us, and then, you know, we applied that. We have this term, it's called Ike Kupuna, or Ike is knowledge. Kupuna is our... Um, grandparents or elders. So a lot of what we've learned comes from our past, comes from our past through us directly to you when we teach. So there's always a connection where um, Eddie Kamai, uh, for one of the forefathers of modern ukulele, you know, he taught Otasan, who taught Roy Sakuma, who taught. <coughs> Herb Ota Jr. So there is that lineage where whatever Herb teaches comes from that past. Whatever I've learned comes from that. So that that's kind of the cultural aspect that we have here in Hawaii where it is Ike Kupuna. You know, it comes from our past and we share that with the world. We also have another saying, 
Aohe pau ka ike i ka halau ho'okahi, which means all knowledge is not or does not come or learn from one source. So I'm so happy and glad to see this international panel here because we all learn differently. We all speak different musical languages, but we can all come to the same outcome. And I'm just honored and um, happy to be here. Thank you for the invite, Peter, and it's great to see all of you. <coughs> Thank you, Brian. I'm gonna uh, go over to Kathy. Kathy Fink, you're up. <clears throat> Hi, everybody, I'm Kathy Fink. I'm currently in Silver Spring, Maryland, though I split my time between here and Lansing, North Carolina. And I come to the ukulele from two different sources. One was my first ukulele, which was a gift from an elderly woman in Montreal when I lived there in about 1973. Her name was Annie Elliott. And I gave her lessons on the Appalachian dulcimer. And at some point to thank me, she gave me this vintage Gibson soprano ukulele that had been in her family for a long time. And to this day, I still have it. I've carried it around with me through 32 moves, including different countries. And my second entree, well, three entrees to the ukulele. My, my second big one is my partner, Marcy Markser, who will speak more elegantly and intelligently than I do. She is a masterful musician on 25 different instruments, but um, she really got the ukulele bug big time in the early 1980s and amongst other things, created educational programs for kids that brought up a lot of people into ukulele world. But needless to say, um, uh, together we play a lot of music and uh, a lot of different styles. And we've brought all of that into our ukulele playing. As a teacher, um, I found it really easy after teaching guitar and banjo and fiddle for years and years and years to adapt my teaching styles to the ukulele. And I think um, my goal as a teacher, whether it be an individual lesson or a class or an online experience, my, my goal is that, that whoever I'm teaching, when they are done with the lesson, they understand something they didn't understand before and they can play something they didn't play before. I've seen a lot of teachers say, okay, here's what we're gonna do. You've got the chart, now go home and learn it. And I prefer to teach shorter segments more thoroughly. I want, to I want a student to feel very, like they've accomplished something in this lesson. They may not have accomplished it to perfection, but through understanding and hands on the ook, be it virtual these days or in person, be it a class or an individual, my goal is through what we call in the old time world, knee to knee, really. That thing where you're looking at somebody and they do it, you do it, they do it back to you, you try it together, back and forth, however many repetitions it takes and however small the unit that you're teaching is. Maybe you're teaching one bar of music, maybe you've got somebody who can learn four bars of music at a time, that doesn't matter to me. I try and assess, you know, how big a bite can we take? And let's not take more than that because you're not gonna get more than that. Let's accomplish that, let's accomplish the next bite, and then let's also learn some good practice techniques for putting it all together. And that's the format that has worked for me individually. It's what we encourage at the Uke Fest that Marcy and I run, the Music Center at Strathmore. We're going into our 13th annual summer Uke Fest, but we had a very successful winter virtual Uke Fest a couple of weeks ago and a baritone ukulele day. So uh, we've stretched out here. And uh, I just want to throw in that I think one of the things that differentiates the ukulele world is in all of the musics that Marcy and I play, there is an, you know, the, picking up the ukulele is like joining a community. It's not even like joining a club. It's like you made a new friend already, you know, and we've seen that work virtually and I'm really thrilled about that. So thanks for the opportunity to be here and uh, share some ideas with these awesome people that I'm all in love with. Thank Including you, Kathy. Who I never met before. There you go. Thank you, Kathy. And it's interesting. I was watching 
Brian nodding his head because much of what you said resonates. Just the idea of knee to knee, um, uh, person to person, which in many ways reflects what Brian talked about. I'm going to now turn it over to James Hill. James. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, Peter, do you want to just, can I take a minute to ask these guys questions or are we just sort of going, going around the circle here? Um, because, because Brian and Kathy, you know, I've known you both for, for a long time and, um, and I really have a lot of very deep abiding respect for, uh, both the old time tradition and the Hawaiian tradition of teaching. And, and of, I wouldn't even call it so much teaching as sort of the, the concept of osmosis, almost that knee to knee is very much part of both, uh, both cultural, uh, ways of transmitting the love of music. Um, and I've said this before on other podcasts and other interviews, but I, I do think that that is maybe the, the, I mean, if I had to pick a way, that would be like the best way to learn is to just sit at the foot of the master. If I'm going to be a sushi chef, I should make rice for a year before I ever get to touch the fish. You know, like there's no quick way. There's no fast track. Um, the reason why the knee to knee sometimes doesn't work in our lives, in our busy lives, is because our lives are so busy. I mean, I've got a week at a camp. I want to absorb a skill. I want to, I don't have time. I don't have a year to make sushi rice. I need it now. I need it yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, so in our, in our modern sort of rush, what are the limits do you think of that, of the knee to knee, uh, sitting at the foot of the master? What, what are the limits of that in, in our, in our modern context? You asking that to anyone specific, James, or just to the well, panel? To, to everyone, especially Brian and, and Kathy, because they just spoke about it. I, I, I think, um, you know, with technology now, um, there are so many great teachers out there. So maybe if there is someone who is interested in that, um, learning the knee to knee, so to speak, that we, we can, we can do that. You know, someone from Canada, someone from, um, whereas, you know, I've been to festivals, I've done it. It's like you're, you're learning every technique in the book in a week, every hour or, or an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. it's, 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 you know, it, it, it's hard to do. Um, so I, I, the best that I can do when I do these things is just expose them to that, mm. you know, that, that, that thought process, mostly that learning process. And if they want to continue, then, you know, then we go from there. But for me, it's, it's more just exposing them to, to say, no, you, you don't have to read a page from book 37 or whatever. <laughs> hey, listen to this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, play this. So I, I give you choices. Now you make the choice. And, and then they, if they enjoy that, um, it's not for everybody. And then, right. you know, then we can, we can talk the long term stuff, you know, down the road. But, you know, I, I remember going, uh, I've been to a lot of Hawaiian camps and taught at a lot of Hawaiian camps and, and sat at the, at the feet of many, you know, Hawaiian masters trying to absorb what I can. But, you know, I, as a Western learner, I would go to workshops with like Uncle Dennis or you know, Uncle George Kahamoku. And, mm -hmm. And, and, you know, when I was younger, I'd leave really frustrated because all they did was tell stories and jokes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, you know, and yeah. I was like, hey, that's not teaching. And, and now I understand, of course, that it was. Yeah. Kathy. It's, but yeah. it's a different type of teaching. Yes. And right. it's, it's a piece of the story, um, but it's not the whole story. And I think, James, I think that's where I zero in on, on your question about, what does and doesn't work about knee to knee because a lot of the music that we've learned through the years in addition to ukulele music is from that grand appalachian tradition where we did hear tons of stories from some great people um those stories i think inform your experience they inform your music and your musicality but those stories don't tell you where to put your fingers or what it <laughs> sounds mm -hmm. like yeah and right I think that's the, you know, I think you want to accomplish both. And in, in today's world with the quote unquote, super busy people, uh, everybody makes choices. They have to make a choice about whether or not they actually want to learn the music. Mm -hmm. And we have all as instructors had people for whom having the instrument and playing, you know, playing two tunes on it makes them happy and that's all they want to do they've made that choice and as a teacher i may or may not inspire them to go past that because 
those that inspiration has to be a two-way street it can't be a sure. one-way street yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's interesting because james i don't know if you recall the very first master you ever sat at the feet of was uh eddie, eddie bush. bush that's right yeah. i still <laughs> remember you sitting on the ground as eddie played yeah. uh with mr nunez in the room as well yeah. and yeah right you got it, it right. that's right with the thumb moving the and thumb. and i think it's i think the one thing that that has to fit into that is having the experience of seeing that is important but I, th I think there's some draw to always coming back to some semblance of a sequence of instruction, some semblance of an order to what you're learning. Even if it's in the Hawaiian culture, there's a direction that it's got to have. It may not be written or stated, mm -hmm. but there is a direction. And I think that that, at the end of the day, um, is, is an important aspect of the learning process. And that boils down to curriculum, be it formal or mm -hmm. informal. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key word, Peter. Yep, yeah. agreed. Yeah. yeah, agreed. James, other comments? Oh, sorry, over to you, Brian. And, and I think, you know, it wasn't teaching, so so to speak. It was more sharing yep. the knowledge mm -hmm. that I have that I want to pass on to you. So there was no structural teaching about those sit-down sessions, you know, those mm -hmm. talk, talk story sessions. But um, it's funny that there may not have been a lot of teaching, but there might have been a lot of learning. Yeah, exactly. Well said. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Agreed. Yes. Uh, Agreed. My, yes. My son, yes. my son loves to read books and he loves to have books read to him. And so often uh, once he has a book that he loves, he'll get to a point where, where you go to read it to him again and he'll look at you and he'll say, no, he said, don't read the book, be the book. Wow. And, and the first time mm -hmm. he said that, I, d I didn't know what he meant. But what he means is he wants you to embody the character and now create a new story and act out as if you were the character and, and make these new imaginary plays happen. Don't be the book, he said. Uh, don't, don't read the book, he said. Be the book. And I mm -hmm. thought, there's a, there's a quote for teachers, if there ever was one. Yeah, very nicely said. Well, and I would say, in a way, James, that he's your son because he... <laughs> that's how you do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that does remind me of James. Yeah. Um, uh, James, any last thoughts before I turn over to Mary? No, I mean, I, I've got lots of uh, ideas about um, how, how things work in a classroom. And I will say, uh, I do have one last thought. And that is, um, I do think that one of the limits of the, of the real, uh, the, the essential teaching process that we're talking about here, the osmosis and knee to knee, which is ultimately the real thing, uh, I do think one of the limits of that is when you get one teacher and a whole bunch of students at one time. Uh, the knee to knee thing can break down a little bit. And that's where I think teachers need teachers who are in that situation, one on many, and who are expected to follow some kind of structure, not just a jam session. Yep. That's where they need resources and they need strategies. And I would say the number one thing, and we can come back to this later because it's a longer Yep. It's a longer piece, but the number one thing that I, that I try to help teachers with is differentiation, where 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 they can have multiple levels simultaneously, where everybody is entertained, where everybody is learning something. Uh, the number one thing teachers say when they sign up for the J. Huey teacher certification program, they say, "Oh, hey, uh, you won't believe this. I, I've got a class of students, and I, I tell you what, it's crazy. Some are really good, and some are in the middle, and some are at the bottom. What am I going to do?" <laughs> You know, and, and, and I look Welcome at the, to the world of teaching. Exactly. I'm like, <laughs> and what were you expecting exactly? Yeah, yeah, they were all homogeneous. They could yeah, all, that's all exactly the same. Uh, so, so that's probably the number one thing that I that I help teachers with is real tangible strategies and, and material that can can make that go more smoothly. Excellent, excellent uh, addition to the discussion. And Mary, as I go over to you, I'm just going to tell you I've noticed a couple of questions in the chat box. I'm going to bring them up after. Eric, thank you for that. Mary, over to you. Oh, hi, thanks. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Mary Agnes Krell. I am the producer and director of Grand Northern Ukulele Festival, or GNUF, here in the UK. And I'm also a professor of creative media at Sussex University, also here in the UK. Um, I've been working with uh, community arts festivals, largely in the music and performance areas for more than two decades on more than two continents. And the festival that I run, which is itself also a ukulele festival, GNUF, um, has won the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service in part, and I say this not just to say that we got an award from the Queen, which is an American living in England, I think is kind of cool, but um, that we did it, we received it for our work uh, focusing on community. And for me, there's two things I think are really important when you're thinking about teaching. The first is that your students form a community 
And one of the most important things for me about thinking through community in terms of our festival or even my own students at the university is how I can make them feel comfortable, welcome, included, feel a part of that community. And so a lot of the work that I do in organizing events, whether they are individual classroom sessions or huge festivals, is try to create situations where we as a team work together, the different artists and uh, the organizers and volunteers to make sure that people just feel welcome. So, um, and I, pretty much everybody here is, has done that. I've, I've been at festivals where James will walk up to a stranger and just say hello. And where Brian will jam with somebody he's never met in a courtyard. I think it's really important to try to create those opportunities for people to feel that they can connect. And I think another uh, thing to consider as a teacher is that one of the ways that you can do that is by you know designing your teaching in an inclusive way so that you have material that different uh, levels or styles of learners can engage with. But another thing that you can do, and I say this because it's something I have had to do persistently throughout my entire adult life, is ask yourself what you can do to be a better teacher. And for me, that's about trying to learn new, different, or interesting ways of designing material for students. This last year has been crazy. I'm uh, the director of education in our school at the university, and I've had to help my colleagues move thousands of modules from face-to-face -to, -face to online in a matter of days when we had our first lockdown during the pandemic. It was a challenge I've never faced before. But what I realized is that some of those skills we learn as teachers, like the necess necessity of breaking material down into small chunks and creating those small wins. So somebody will come to your class and work on a small piece of information and feel that they have mastered that, even though they will probably need to continue to practice it and have not in fact yet mastered it. And they'll go away and want to do more. It might inspire them to do more or to practice more or to engage more. So I think that for me, the most important things are thinking about community and, and who your community is, how they might feel included or connected. And then asking yourself, what will help you become a better teacher? What, what can you learn? And it's hard to say, I, what do I not know? How do I know what I don't know? But I think attending things like this, uh, signing up for the James's uh, ukulele initiative, uh, going to a seminar or a workshop at one of Ben's festivals, uh, going along to Strathmore for one of their great events, or uh, signing up and making time for yourself to take part in one of those knee-to-knee -knee kind of uh, tradition or more traditional kinds of training sessions could work for you. And you just need to ask yourself, what is it that's going to work for you? So that's my more than two P worth. Ah, nice. Nicely said. And again, lots of connectivity between things that others have said and, and your own experiences, Mary. And I can attest to the fact that it, it absolutely is a community that you build through each of your events. Brian, before I go to Byron, over to you. Yeah, so I, I think the common thread between all of us and great teachers is we have the passion for teaching. You know, we didn't go to university, okay, I'm gonna study four years, I'm gonna become a teacher. Um, I didn't go that route. I just have the passion for sharing, you know, and, and that's the common thread that we have, I think. We, we love what we do, not just as performers, but as teachers, and that's, that's the great thing, you know, that we all have, so. Thanks for sharing that. Byron, it's uh, great to have you here. Byron is our elder statesman on the panel. He's now 60. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're very kind. Uh, well, can you all hear me? Okay. Um, I guess, what are we doing? Introducing ourselves, uh, our background. I, I started playing ukulele around 13 years old when I was uh, about a freshman in high school or eighth grade, I can't remember. And uh, self-taught completely, never studied with anybody. And growing up in our neighborhood, some of the kids played ukulele and so you learn one song from this person and another song from another person and i found out that in different neighborhoods in honolulu uh we all played the same songs but slightly differently like for example crazy g is one thing that almost all local kids learn but the way that benny chong plays it is very different from the way that i learned it it's all folk music it's all oral tradition nothing's written and uh and we all play the same kind of tunes like lady of spain and oh granada we try to play stars and stripes forever 
and all instrumental stuff, a lot of strumming. And uh, then around 1960, so after when I was about 19 years old, I gave up the ukulele. I became a jazz bass player. And I didn't touch the ukulele for 34 years until I was asked to play the ukulele for different groups and for the Ukulele Hall of Fame Museum Expo. And that got me slowly back into playing the ukulele again. And slowly I got um, requests to teach ukulele. And now I'm teaching, um, well, I taught beginning ukulele at the University of Hawaii. After I, ret I retired in 2010. And in 2015, the university asked me to come back and teach. So I did. And this was a great learning experience. And when you teach, you learn. You know, uh, I had students, uh, college students, taking the course for credit. And then I had a lot of pupunas, elder senior citizens who could take classes for free with the teacher's instruct, uh, permission. And that was an experience because now I have this class of young kids, 20 years, 20 years old in that age bracket. And then the kupunas who are over 60. And I try to uh, accommodate everybody. Now, <clears throat> most of the young students at the university that I had in my class were from Asian countries, from China, Korea, Japan. So you can imagine the difficulty I have. I, I say, okay, let's learn, uh, let's strum chords and learn to sing songs like uh, You Are My Sunshine. And, they couldn't relate to those songs, you know, and the songs that the old folks wanted would be very different from the songs that the young kids wanted. So that was that opened my mind to um, tuning into the Internet more and more to learn the kind of songs they want. So I asked, I asked the young kids, well, what kind of songs would you want to want us to learn? And one request was California Hotel. I don't know if you know that song. I never heard of that song. James, you probably know that song, you know. And and so I had to go to the internet and learn the song and write the figure out the best key for them to sing it in. And that was an experience. And then in 2017, I started teaching a senior, senior citizen class at a private club in Waikiki, the Outrigger Canoe Club. I hope some of them are watching. <laughs> um <clears throat> and they asked me to teach them. I said, well, I didn't want to do that. But I said, okay, I'll try it for eight weeks, once a week. And uh, we did it. And at toward the end of the eight weeks, he said, can we continue some more? So we did. And long story short, we're going on three years now. We've been going all this time. And uh, they really love it. And you know what? We've bonded. I've come to love them and enjoy it. And all we do is I teach them chords to accompany singing. I'm not teaching them solo ukulele playing because the the range of the uh, the skills is very you know extreme. They have some who are just beginning, and some who just who have been playing for quite a while. Uh, so I I would teach I would show them uh, some tablature notation, and for those who wanted to learn picking, they could learn that way on their own. So anyway. Um, and listening to you all talk, my question to you is, what uh, aspect of ukulele playing are you teaching? Are you teaching solo picking, melody scales, music reading, or just strumming chords to accompany singing? Because those are the common uh, modes of playing, I guess, that teachers do. Like, the, I have the impression that most ukulele teachers teach just chord strumming. So you learn the basic C, F, and G7, and you sing songs in your voice range. Uh, but I have no idea what you all teach. Do you teach that as well as picking, or you don't teach that at all? You just do picking. So Byron, so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that out to the, uh, to the group to respond to, because I think okay. that's something that our listeners would be interested in. Uh -huh. The one comment I want to make about what you said, I find it extremely interesting that you've actually listed off a syllabus. You, you, what you did was you said, here, is, here were the pieces that our community found to be important uh, milestones or, or markers in terms of learning to play the instrument. 
I find that very interesting for a whole other realm of reasons, but thank you for yeah. that. Yeah, one, yeah, one thing I learned was the, the songs that I pick, well, first of all, you have to pick songs that they like, that they can relate to, otherwise you're losing them, you know? Yep. And, and, and you have to find the key that, that's in the range that we can sing. Yep, and, <laughs> and and the key that they can play, in, like yep. C, of C, F, or A, are good because they have open strings. You know, good. Byron, uh, let, let me put your yeah. question over to the panel. I see Kathy sure, has something sure. she wants to say. Go ahead. Well, Kathy. it's interesting because you you just nailed a whole bunch of the things that we just taught in our winter ukulele festival, and I think, um, you know, yeah. The, the things that you talked about are the starting place, but it the Strathmore Uke Fest and so many of the Uke Fests that we've attended and taught at, um, you have the opportunity to teach different skills in different classes at different levels. And one of the things that we've specifically focused on in Strathmore is uh, building those skills so that as people come back and they've improved, they have the next class to go to. In fact, James, about five years ago, taught the first audition only advanced class at our Uke Fest. And yeah. we I just found it. Because... I just found a copy of the handout of that the other day. It was called <laughs> it was called Ukulele Confidential. And the and the front cover of the handout had this big like combination lock on it. <laughs> it's like you gotta well, wanna we... get into this class. We do it like that, and since this is going out to a large group of people, because people don't really know how to assess their own playing, you know, and in the ukulele world, not unlike the banjo and guitar world, if you've owned an instrument for a long time, you may just automatically consider yourself an advanced player, <laughs> but that doesn't, those two things are not related. You're, you're an advanced so, owner. Yeah, exactly. Advanced <laughs> owner. And so we started this methodology of asking people to audition in, not to keep people out, but to make sure that they're getting in, to make sure that advanced players can learn and at an advanced pace and at an advanced level. Um, sometimes we'll just say to somebody, you know, you're right on the cusp. But why don't you try it? And if it doesn't, number one, promise that you're not going to hold the class back. And number two, if it isn't a fit, go to another class quickly. So you don't miss too much of that. But I think that, um, Byron, what we've done is offered these skill-based uh, curriculum classes in the morning for each skill level. And then in the afternoon, drop-in classes, again, at very, some of them are all levels and some of them are advanced and some are intermediate, trying to give people an opportunity to learn at their own level, but also creating community opportunities where, you know, our harmony singing class, I'm not going to say it has nothing to do with playing the ukulele because anything that you learn in harmony singing is going to enhance what you do with ukulele, but it's not going to be based on your ukulele skills. And that gives us a chance to bring everybody in the same room and enhance some other skills as well. Well said, really well said. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just interject and then offer others a chance through Chalmers uh, program that I, I used in Langley for the 35 years that I taught and now continue to do with adults. Uh, Byron, it addresses all the aspects. That was one of the things that, that that program really focused on was that it gave the ability to read notation, the ability to play by ear, the, the understanding of the theory around music, the idea of combining melody and harmony. Yes, of course, strumming and singing, but all of those components would be introduced during two lessons a week in a classroom, two lessons a week for 45 minutes or 35 minutes each lesson. Well, at the end of the year, you had students who were extremely proficient in music. Yes, they, they learned it through playing the ukulele, but they became extremely proficient musically uh, across the board. So to your, your point, th there is the option there for learning all aspects of music and music education through the use of the ukulele. It, it is possible, but if, if I can just jump in, you also have to, as a teacher, uh, choose your battles. And, and I think you have to tailor your approach to your students and to your own interests and, and aptitudes. So the, the main question that I ask all my teachers as they're coming through my certification program, the first thing we have to get clear on is, is the ukulele a vehicle or a destination? This is, this is the main question that you have to address and there's no right answer to that. 
But if you think of the ukulele as a destination, then you are teaching things that are native to the ukulele. It's things like tablature are fine, uh, chord diagrams, singing and strumming, because you, you don't necessarily want to lead anywhere beyond the ukulele. It's an end unto itself. Let's all just hop in the pool and, and have a swim and, and everybody's happy. Uh, those who think that the ukulele is a vehicle, uh, they're going to teach differently. They're going to use different materials. They're going to make different decisions about even what tuning to use, uh, whether to teach picking early on, uh, whether to teach standard notation or tablature. All of the little questions that we like to haggle over online and forums and argue about at festivals, all of these questions are pretty much answered in one fell swoop. If you can just be clear with yourself and your students about whether the ukulele is a vehicle or a destination. Yeah, nicely said, really nicely said. I'm cognizant of time and I wanna make sure that we get to our final two panelists. So Marcy, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, give you a chance to introduce yourself and speak to your experience in teaching. Okay, well, hi everybody. This is great. It's a fabulous group of people, great discussion. Um, I started teaching music when I was in high school. I got hired by the University of Michigan, uh, Flint, to teach adult community education and then was teaching guitar, mainly guitar. But that process was something I really fell in love with. And in time, um, within a couple years, I was also teaching hammer dulcimer, which I, was my first instrument. I started playing guitar when I was five, but I grew up playing with my, my grandmother. Um, and then I started uh, in, the, in the 80s, started uh, taught through music stores and things like that and other community education programs. But it was such a beautiful process to break everything down, to try to get to, you know, how to hold your hands, how to save your hands, how to make sure they don't hurt, um, all the little details that, you know, it's kind of geeky, but you know, we just love it. All of us love it. And um, I made a, a VHS, two VHS series for Homespun in the eighties. One was called Kids Guitar One and Two, and the other series was Ukulele for Kids One and Two. And I didn't realize that a lot of people who thought they couldn't play were picking up the kids programs and going through those videos. So and that was when they were, you know, this big and you put them in and you could check them out from the library, which was really great. Eventually they were updated. Um, but every time technology changes, we change with it. So the addition of DVDs that you could fast forward was really, really great. I, I teach online for truefire.com, uh, guitar, mandolin, and ukulele, tenor, banjo, and also uh, Peghead Nation, ukulele only, um, and these other things for homespun, a lot of guitar stuff. But what I think this does for us, and of course, Kathy and I are in the folk genre, um, we also play swing, early jazz, other kinds of things. And one thing I, I just love about these various genres that are, are based around the feel and the swing and the harmony and just the, the group, really, is that all these instruments can play together. So I know that we're talking about ukulele here, but everybody who plays some jazz chords can play with any other instrument who's playing those those tunes or folk chords, straight ahead chords for beginners, all that stuff. Um, but what I really like about teaching online is communicating with the people that used to just buy a program. So um, I would be in a place like California or some other, you know, other country or something, and some little kids would come on and look at me and say, hey. You know, I have your, which was very cool. Very, very cool. But I also say in my videos, if you see me at a gig, bring your instrument and we'll sit down and play a song. And that has been wonderful. But now I'm communicating with people all the time. We're sending videos back and forth. Um, we can be up close and personal. Uh, I think that it's really wonderful to break things down for the bare beginner. There are so many people I'm noticing who are sending me notes who just got a ukulele and they're not sure what to do with it. But even as basic as in a group of kids, a school group of kids or something like that, holding your hand up like this and saying, okay, 
this is my strumming hand. It's relaxed, isn't it? Yeah, before they even get a ukulele in their hand. Now just keep your fingers and thumb relaxed. Pull up your hand and see what position it's in. Oh, yeah. Now, if you're going to play a guitar, you might slip a flat pick in there, but you want to stay relaxed. Now you're going to strum your ukulele. Take that position, put it in right in front of you, and let your hand relax before they even get an instrument in their hands. And also talking about the left hand, when they have their instrument in their hands, just lightly touch the strings, like bouncing on the strings, even if they're not playing with their right hand. Like this is how hard this should be. It isn't hard to push these strings down. So always remember, if you're straining and you're stressing, it's probably because you're doing something your hands haven't done before. It's, uh, and always go back and look. You know, if you're squeezing really hard, just loosen up, loosen up and try it again. Uh, but I really love these new forms of teaching. I'm taking James's class, um, for teacher's certification in the Jehui. I'm also just kicked off a new... I think for me, it's a step ahead of teaching online, a new performing ensemble online, where uh, we just kicked it off last night. So what we're gonna do is is uh, play and sing, play a chorded melody version of a tune. This week, we'll, we'll pluck melodies next uh, another time. Then I send people rhythm tracks. They record themselves and send on video, send them to me and I compile them into one gigantic, uh, performance piece, which is lovely. I mean, at a festival or a camp that takes, you're there for three or four days, you could do that on the first day. And by the last day, you could have a performance with everybody or a bunch of people anyway, whoever wants to. So I think we have, in some ways, we have a front row seat to any class and every student has a front row seat. And we have to just, yeah, every student has a front row seat. And I love the way people teach. You know, I took classical guitar lessons as a kid. I love, I, I haven't had much demand for reading music in my career. Usually people give me a chord chart if they give me anything. And they usually give me a blank piece of paper for, uh, and a pencil. So um, to figure out what you're doing in recording studios. Um, but the way James teaches is I can see a touching on every one of the aspects we talked about from the very first moment. And I think that's so important because brains are wiring, you know, synapses are, are connecting in ways they may not have done before. So somebody who's used to reading music has got to have that experience of knee to knee that we were talking about before. It's got to have that experience of listening and hearing where the chord changes are. Um, so at that point, um, I will turn it back over to Peter. All right. And we can get on to Ben, unless you have any questions for me. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, that's, that's really good. And of course, at the essence of, of any teaching um, that's effective, in my view, uh, is the, the ability to do critical thinking. Uh, that's when that t the teaching sticks and uh, the, the learning sticks. So any process that we have that allows the students to go through learning from each other, the synergy in a classroom, or it's far more difficult online, but that ability to learn uh, through synergy and that ability to connect through critical thinking is critical. <laughs> critical thinking, critical. <laughs> Over to you, Ben. Take it away. Man, I tell you, the uh, I've learned so much already from everybody. Um, my, my, I keep writing all these notes down. Um, Anyway, I'm Ben Hassinger. I'm the ukulele ambassador of Michigan. I should have put that up there. And uh, what I did, my first experience uh, to the ukulele, 2009 in Hawaii, uh, I saw the Luango Ukulele Ensemble play at the Ukulele Festival of Hawaii. And actually, I went to the... Uh, it's the Waikiki, right? The Sheridan Waikiki right afterwards. That's right. And got my first ukulele lesson from Mr. Peter Luongo. Yeah. And of course, I'd been a guitar player all the time. So it was a, you know, pretty easy uh, transfer there. But that really got me hooked on the ukulele. And uh, we started in Lansing, Michigan. We started a, a big ukulele strumming group, which then turned into a festival which then turned into a nonprofit that supports ukulele programs in schools. 
and libraries and things like that, community classrooms and communities. And then it turned into a running a seniors group, uh, having quite a huge seniors program in East Lansing, Michigan, and also moved itself into teaching uh, English as a second language using <laughs> the ukulele. So what I found out, Byron was talking about working with a lot of students from other countries. Uh, we're by a university here, Michigan State University, and uh, we have a lot of students uh, who are here like for a year or something and their spouse needs, you know, is looking for something to do. So they would come over to this English school and then I would start a, uh, start an ukulele program and people would come and, you know, some people had a little bit of knowledge. Some people had never picked up an instrument. Actually, a lot of my Asian students had played piano, um, but had never played a stringed instrument. And we just all got together and it was such a great way to learn English, you know, learn pronunciation. Uh, some of the big differences in English and other language are vowel pronunciations. And so we take actually Byron, Byron was talking about you are my sunshine. And uh, that was a song I found everybody in the world knows that song. It's amazing. I was in China riding a taxi cab once and playing it on the ukulele and singing with the cab driver. So um, <laughs> it's pretty, he had a cell phone and was talking to some friend and they were laughing. But uh, um, I, I've just found the ukulele to be a great entrance into music for so many people. Um, you know, everybody goes, oh, the ukulele, it's such an easy instrument. And I go, well, you know, it's a musical instrument that you can take as far as you want. And I tell them, look up James Hill, you know, look up Jake Shimabukuro, uh, you know, look up any number of these artists and you can see where it goes. But unlike a guitar, unlike some other instruments, you can pick up an ukulele and you can, you can start playing music in a half hour, you know, two or three chords. James has his chord twin uh, things there uh, where it's the same shape and you just move it over. And uh, I've just found it can, Again, it, you can go as far as you want with it, but it gives people instant gratification. And uh, mainly now I'm working with seniors and I have a lot of folks and um, I'm sure a lot of us can relate to this, that in the 60s, okay, they had a flower in their hair and saying, if you're going to San Francisco on their guitar, and then they had to give it up for work or family or whatever. And now they come back and man, that guitar is hard to play. You know, we've all got a little arthritis or things like that. <laughs> and it's like, but I want to play music and it can pick up the ukulele, kind of pick up where they left off, maybe on the guitar or if they never played an instrument before, you know, we can get going pretty quickly and then sky's the limit from there. However far you want to take it. I don't know if it was James or somebody was talking about some people are, you know, they're happy with just, uh, learning, you know, four or five first position chords and they can play and sing songs together. It's such, I say it's, uh, I call it the most folk of folk instruments because it brings folks together. Yeah. And uh, what Mary Agnes was talking about, the community aspect of it all, I think is hugely important. Um, and it's what keeps this whole ukulele thing going. Yeah, I, Ben, really nicely said. What a nice way to sum up sort of the, the discussion that we've had and, and bringing it back to that very real essence of the community learning to play and the community being bonded. Um, I, I'm In the few minutes that we have left, I've been really uh, impressed by some of the questions that the audience have put forward and has been shared. I've got one here that, that I think each and any one of you could respond to, and I'd be curious to hear. With the pandemic, this is the question, with the pandemic, many players are turning in, into teachers without the necessary teaching background. What are some of the biggest mistakes you notice with modern players come teachers? Okay, I'm gonna start with Marcy on this and then I'm gonna to go to Brian and I'll take it from there. One is the approach of, um, I just wanna do it my way because beginners don't have a way. Um, I hear that attitude quite a bit and I see it online so having a structured, well, and then we'll take people with that same attitude. 
see them a year later, they haven't progressed. So going with a program that is structured, beginning, middle, you know, step by step is, is really the way to go. Mm-hmm. Thanks. And also having a clear practice regimen, keep a log of the practice of people's practice. And teachers need to know their own strong points. If a teacher really knows three or four chords and wants to start teaching, that's great, but they have to know that they only know three or four chords. So that's what they can do best is really use their enthusiasm to get people interested, but then they have to know where to send them from there or they have to progress themselves. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Brian. I I think the assumption is that, wow, you know, these guys are great players, so they must be great teachers. And we all know that that's not the case. Right. You know, I, I think if, if you're looking um, for teachers, you should do your homework. You know, like like we have resumes for our gigs and stuff like that. There should be some sort of teaching resume um, that you can look at. Um, because, right, everyone assumes, yeah, this guy can play. He must be a great teacher. Um, not always the case. No. <laughs> Well said. Uh, I'm going to go over to Kathy and Ben, you might want to wade in on this. I'm sensing you want to. Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah. Um, I feel like before putting yourself out there as a teacher, you can practice teaching. One of the things that we've done in, in, in our Uke Fest is bring up new teachers. We brought in several new teachers this round, and we actually spend the mentoring time with them to help them prepare for breaking things down. Remember, teaching is really beyond the storytelling part of it that Brian talked about. When you're down to the skill set, it's about how do you break things down into small bites that somebody else can learn. And by example, today I got pitched for the Strathmore Uke Fest from a great sounding pop band, Uke centric, great sounding pop band. And, you know, they've They've been around the world. They had a nice little resume. I listened to their music. It sounded fabulous. And I said, what's your teaching experience? And what do you teach on the ukulele? Because we're actually a teaching festival. And they and I gave them some samples of the kind of stuff that we do. And they said, now we're really performers. We don't really, we're, we're actually not teachers. And I, I needed them to recognize that. And that doesn't mean that a performer can't make that transition. That's the question at hand right now. But what they have to do is put themselves into beginner mind and think about, if I didn't know this, what would it take for me to learn it? And these days with all of the assets that we have, there's no excuse to not practice your teaching before you do it. Yeah. You know, you get a friend and, and see how it communicates with them. You get a buddy, you try it. You need to put your best foot forward out there because in fact, this screen is full of phenomenal teachers and you know there's a hundred more that we could all name. It doesn't mean that there isn't room for more. There's so many communities looking at the chat here of people in their own communities. But remember that teaching is its own skill set and start working on that. Don't just think, because I can play, I can teach. Yeah, extremely well said. I'm gonna go to Ben, and I see Mary Nodden too, and I wanna get to her. I'm just gonna interject, it's interesting. I'm working with six young people, six high school students, um, mentoring them and helping them, just as uh, James came out of Langley Ukulele, as did our son Paul, as did Mark, and and have, have really sort of taken the experience of being in a classroom setting and help use those skills from good teachers to model their own practice going forward. The key thing I've said to these young people that I work with, what is your intention? What are you walking in there to do at the start? And what do you hope to have the students, the students able to do at the end? That has to be your intention. And I think as as people look for a teacher, uh, students might wanna ask, "What what is it that you're gonna present to me? How are you gonna get me to play in a way that allows me to be a learner. Ben, over to you and then to Mary. Well, I, I think uh, <clears throat> the discussion, just because someone's a great player, um, doesn't mean they're a good teacher. It's very true. I'm sure Mary um, and Kathy and Marcy, all of us that have run festivals, 
um, you know, you, you have to know what your festival is focused to. Okay. I run a camp called Midwest Uke and Harmonica Camp. I hire 16 instructors and we have 64 workshops over a weekend. And that is very much, I'd say, 75% teaching and maybe 25% performance. Because we do have a staff concert. It's a lot of fun. People love that. But the main focus by far is teaching. So I'm pretty picky about the teachers I choose. That's why I've chosen so many of these people up here on the state, on the screen. And, uh, and then I also host another festival called Mighty Youth Day, and uh, which James is... James has been it for sure a couple of times and uh, teaching is very important there, but it also has a huge performance aspect to that too. So I can kind of mix and match a little bit differently in something like that. But um, yeah, I think it just has, I think it helps just to have a good background as a teacher, you know, whether it's music teaching or English or whatever, um, just so you know, so you know how to look, read the crowd, right? you don't just get in your own little mindset and forget what everybody's doing. You can look at them and go, you can tell the blanks face, you know, they're not getting it and things like that. So um, there's different strokes for different folks as far as uh, how the festival runs. But for me, the teaching is a huge priority. Anything with my name on it um, that I'm involved with teaching is prime is the primary focus. Yep. Yeah. And, and what you've said, it's what can the student do? It's not about me. It's about the student. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mary and then Brian. Okay. I'll be brief. I totally agree with that. I think if you want to teach, even if it's outside of a festival context, two really important things to help you avoid those kind of trappings of kind of performers becoming teachers and new teachers is, is go learn how other people teach. There's great resources here. Peter Luongo, Kathy and Marcy, Ben, Brian, James, Byron, they're all teaching. Look at their websites, look at what they're doing, perhaps sign up for something that they have. Look at what they've written. James has written some fantastic articles and Kathy and Marcy have given some great interviews as has Peter about what they do and how they teach. And you can begin to understand how they break things down. And most importantly, and this for me is key. And this is how I approach my own teaching at the university and at festivals and in other contexts, have a plan. And when you look at your plan and think it's gonna take an hour, cut it in half because that half hour of content will fill that hour. Have a plan and always remember that bite-sized chunks. Try not to fill the time, leave space. And with that, I'll stop to leave a bit of space. Nicely said. Brian. Brian, you have to unmute. That's the expression from 2020. You're on mute. I, I knew it's that. It's a silent teaching method. I, I knew that. <laughs> okay. No. I thought I mean, you were just leaving some space. I thought yeah, <laughs> this is like performance a, art. This is a lot, a lot of space. You know, with music, <laughs> yeah. you need to let it breathe. Um, well, anyway, <laughs> yeah. no, I, I would always tell myself because I, I like to be engaging. I, I mean, you guys know me. I don't want to be my math teacher growing up. You know, just sprouting out formulas, no engagement. And Mary hit it on the head, man. And um, yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate all of you. As teachers, you know, we still learn. I love sitting and listening to James or Byron or whoever. It's not necessarily I'm trying to learn content, but I'm just watching the way they express themselves and they get their points across. That is, I think, what makes us or me or all of us great teachers. I love sitting in classes, watching people teach. You know, and it helps me become a more effective teacher. Yeah, I think I think you have to get obsessed about it. it, it we all, yeah. we all did that when we first started doing anything. Uh, it wasn't it, it, at one point it switched from being a casual relationship to being a serious relationship. Mm -hmm. And I remember going online in my early days, two thousand two, two thousand three, and deciding, yes, I'm going to be I'm going to be an ukulele player. I'm going to be a performer. I'm going to do this. My first thing. Uh, beyond just you know practicing and getting to be a better player was to go online and become obsessed about who was out there and what they were doing and one of the first people I found was Brian and so I mean I've been stalking you since then you know, it was quite, <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry and, and, <laughs> and I and I think but you have to take it on as part of your identity say I am a yeah. teacher 
I am going to be proud of the teaching that I do. This is part of my thing. This is not a side hustle. I think that's where you get a lot of, a lot of young yeah, yeah, and inexperienced yeah, yeah, yeah. teachers doing it until the pandemic is over. It's just a side hustle. It can't be that. You have to become obsessed about it. It has to become part of your identity, and you have to find the fun in it for you. It has to feed you. Otherwise, it's just not going to take off. Yeah, do, do it because you love it. I love it. Folks, we have a limited amount of time, and I know Byron wants to say something. I'm going to give everybody a chance to make just one comment about uh, teaching the ukulele or learning to play the ukulele. Just one comment around the table. Byron, I'm going to start with you because you've been waving your hand. Unmute. Unmute, big guy. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Yeah, I'm trying to answer the original question. What are some of the biggest mistakes you notice with modern players? Uh, yeah, players who teach um, and they may not be qualified to teach is they, you have to be careful. Students have to take what they say with a grain of salt because they might say things like, well, here's a, here's how you hold, this is a C6 chord, but it's also an A minor seven chord and also an F major seven nine and how do you know when to call it what? And it all has to do with what the bass player should be playing. And so, but many ukulele player, the teachers might not be aware of that fact about the importance of the bass function. And the other thing is, uh, the, the well, I'll just find an example. They might be spouting information about scales and, and they'll call out the pitches of the E major scale as E, F sharp, A flat, <laughs> instead of G sharp and B flat, and so on, you know. Um, oh. So, uh, <laughs> oh. That's all. That's all. Ah, thank you, Byron. <laughs> Ka Kathy, last thoughts from you. Um, I, I just feel like every teacher needs to think about the student first. And what they're in it for, what you have to offer them. And also, it's valid, and this will happen from time to time, to realize you might not be the right teacher for that person. Hmm. And who do you feel, you know, my goal with each student is to make sure I'm meeting their goals. Hmm. And if for whatever reason, it may be stylistic or something like that, I feel like, you know, you're going to get more out of taking some lessons from that person. Mm -hmm. I don't mind doing that. It doesn't yeah. happen a lot, but it does happen from time to time. Or maybe they want to learn. I mean, they just may want to learn something that I don't do. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to fake it. I'm going to say you're going to meet your goals better by checking out these other instructors. Mm -hmm. And um I think it's important to be really clear on what their goals are and and be able to meet them. Thanks, Kathy. Mary, last thoughts? This is really quick. We haven't said it. Ask your students for feedback mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and use that to improve your teaching. Mm -hmm. Well said. James, and then over to Mars. <laughs> Which end do I blow into? I, okay, uh, I I would say one thing is uh, is keep the creativity in the classroom. I, I I think a lot of problems that we often get bogged down with technical solutions to can be solved by opening up uh, a creative avenue for students. I see this all the time. It's something that we focus on in the Jehui program, um, and the ukulele lends itself to both a structured uh, sequential pedagogy that also has a kind of the, the sort of aerated it, you don't find this in say for example uh suzuki violin i would be very surprised to show up to a suzuki violin uh recital i love suzuki i grew up with suzuki but i'd be very surprised to show up to a recital and hear uh, a student play their own introduction to the piece or or play their own ending before you know that would be very unusual. I don't think that would happen. Where with the ukulele, we have an, uh, had the ability to be extremely structured and yet have some elbow room in the pedagogy. And I think it's a wonderful uh, opportunity that doesn't come up very often. Yeah, nicely said. Marcy. 
Well, those of us who teach also love curriculums, love the way a beautiful curriculum is put together. And one of the best ones we've seen, is, Kathy and I am talking about the two of us now, is called Handwriting Without Tears, which is a handwriting curriculum for preschool children. Now, you may say, how does that fit the ukulele? Um, it's step by step in a way that I had never seen before for kids so young. And also making things so deliberately small and uh, and giving people a way to accomplish something and really accomplishing it without just telling them they're doing fine. Um, that also works beautifully with older people, with seniors too. Yeah. Give them just the right amount to let them feel an accomplishment and propel them to make the next accomplishment. Yeah, nice, nicely said. I love that, learning from other ways and teaching other subjects and then fold over. Good thinking. Brian Tolentino. Um, just love what you do, you know, um, have the passion for what you do and, and follow that. Because um, we all love what we do, whether it be performing and or teaching, you know, so just, just love what you do. Yeah, nicely said. Ben. Yeah, I, I love that, Brian, because I think, you know, your enthusiasm um, really uh, continues over to the the audience they pick that up you know they know or the audience your students right. um they they know if you're enjoying it or if you're just going through the motions and you have to love it yeah but you also need to have the knowledge behind that love too <laughs> you know to really yeah. make it work mm -hmm. well well said you know they they say if you want to have a successful event just pick great people to do the job with you uh, this has been a treat for me because you've all been fantastic. I want to thank you very much for your contributions. I, I've heard from Eric that the online community is loving this. They've appreciated the insight from the panel. And I just want to remind everybody who's listening in, who's watching, that tomorrow at 1.30 we're doing a second session. This one will be dealing with uh, the COVID online learning models that we use that we find effective. Until then, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Peter. Aloha. Thank you, Peter. Peter. Mahalo. Yay, Thank, Peter. You, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Eric, all you guys. <laughs> Same time.